before when I started Wedding Sutra, people just wondered what the wedding industry was about. And there was not, not even an awareness on someone called a wedding planner. And today, when we have so many people talk about the wedding ecosystem and, uh, and the size, the employment it generates, and for me, when someone asks me what is the size of the wedding industry, I say it is very, very difficult to put it in a tangible value because the wedding industry is the happiness industry. Weddings are a way of life in India. And we all know how much we missed attending those weddings during the COVID times. I said, that's why I say it may be the largest industry, first, second, third, I don't know. But one thing is sure, we are all part of the happiness industry. So I'd like to start with, uh, you know, we've been talking about India's readiness, but the first question is to Vandana. And this is really about the incredible India edge. So you have traveled to some of the most amazing locations around the world, you've orchestrated weddings all around the world. But what is the edge which we have when it comes to hospitality, and uh, the way hotels uh, in India really uh, help you uh, put together weddings. The India Edge, incredible India Edge. I'm sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, may I once again request everyone to kindly settle down. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some very eminent dignitaries on the stage. And as a mark of respect for all of them, I would request everybody to kindly settle down. All those who need to have a conversation are requested to kindly move outside the hall and carry on the conversation. Uh, ge gentlemen, can we have some order in the place out of respect? And this is not me speaking for myself. I speak for general decorum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, just want to thank everybody who's been on the dais before for just making sure that we people as a group can work together and we have a future with all of us together. So thank you for that. Um, Parthip, to answer your question, yes, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have traveled the world with the weddings that we've done all across. Um, but you asked me what is the edge that we have here, which nobody else has. We have the edge of our hearts. We have the edge of hospitality. We have the edge of where we actually mean what we say, that guests for us are God. For us, the edge in India is our backdrops that we have, the palaces that we have, the unseen backdrops that the DJ and um, Mrs. Jotsna Suri was speaking about. There is so much that we have that is unseen. Um, and I think the biggest edge that we have, I have done 40 countries abroad, worked in so many of 40 them. 40 countries, wow. Every time I come back to India, the overwhelming feeling of joy, of uh, happiness, of inclusiveness, and the fact that we actually mean when we say Aditi Bhavpeo, we actually welcome our guests. So for me, that's the biggest edge that we have. You know, Monisha, Vandana has spoken about the amazing backdrops. And uh, you know, the palace properties and you know, beaches, mountains, palaces. But we all know how Marriott, we know of many of your hotels which have been business hotels, but you've been hosting the, uh, you know, the weddings in the city too, for those who are not able to travel. Yeah. And how, how, did you, how, did, how did Marriott really make this transition into this whole being active in the wedding space and being a sought after property for weddings? Yeah. Partha, first, thank you so much for having me as a part of the panel. My pleasure. Um, so I think one of the things is that like the wedding industry for us, uh, yes, we have a lot of business properties, but we've noticed that the advantage is an empty space is left to the event planners and they do a great job of decoration. So we've never really found that to be. And that's one challenge. reason why wedding planners also like those spaces yes. which they can transform, yes. right? Yes. So I think it's also because of the spaces sure. uh, that we're able to provide them. And more than anything else, as you've heard, we have 150 now in India. So it's, I think it's also in terms of our, uh, you know, the kind of locations 
So I guess the wedding segment for us, our IP of Shadi by Marriott, I think could grow because of that, because right. of you know the number of the number of hotels that we are opening. But we've not seen it as a challenge at all that not having palaces. Uh, so because there are so many creative entrepreneurs there who you give them a space. And huh? and they, they, would have, magic. they would have trained at WCDC at some point, they would have worked at amazing locations, but you give them a plain banquet hall and it's left to their imagination. Great. Thank you, Manisha. So there's Shadi by Marriott and then there's timeless weddings at the Taj. Taj has the most sought, some of the most sought after locations in the world. And I'd like to know from you, Ritika, is what is typically the planning process like uh, in terms of, you know, in how many months in advance do families or wedding planners, because I say that because it's not just planners who book the property. Nowadays, many people will find you on LinkedIn, they'll get in touch with the general manager, find a way to get in touch with the hotel directly. But typically, how many months in advance is the booking done? So thank you, Parthiv. Uh, it's actually, it's so interesting to go back and be on a panel uh, because of Wedding in India. And I think that just talks about the maturity of the industry that the world recognizes today. Sure. I think like Vandana said, and like all the speakers said earlier today, uh, there is so much which is rich cultural heritage in India that we bring to the table. And I think uh, because India is a land of tradition, and India is a land which also goes back and is moving forward at a very fast pace, uh, with its feet firmly rooted in its traditional uh, cultural values, I think that's why weddings remain where they are, at the center of everything, right? Like you said, it's the happiness industry. Uh, so from our perspective, when I take a look at it, uh, well, weddings are timeless, love is timeless. If you want to go back and embark on a journey of togetherness, you want to make sure that everything is right for you. So like they say, marriages are made in heaven, but surely I think the stars and the planets do go back and govern what happens on that. Uh, so, of course, in the presentation earlier, we saw something about the auspicious dates. And that is something which is very much rooted in our culture. And, you know, we are a multi-faith, multicultural society today. So Arranged marriages coexist with love marriages. Of course. And big fat weddings coexist with slim with, and smart with, weddings. With intimate small weddings. And like you said, during the pandemic, uh, when weddings, when you think about it, what really revived everything? Because a wedding is about hope. So the amount of weddings that suddenly happened and even, you know, the authorities across the country worked with everybody to try and make do, what could be the norms, uh, I think just talks about it. So from our perspective and planning, uh, what I see, because uh, both the families want to go back, they want to make sure that they are actually projecting who they are, uh, carrying their family traditions uh, in rituals into, you know, what they want to project. It's typically between 12 to 16 months. 12 and to 16 months. Sometimes yeah. two years. Yes, wow. sometimes two years, that's true. And you can never plan enough, right? Because you want to be like, uh, when, you, you, when you meet the brides initially. You said 12 to 16, but I would think that it has reduced a little post-COVID. I think it has, but not really. Because, you know, people do know that they want to get married and how they want to get married. It's a and dream. social media only gives them more clarity, more and, clarity. It and gives more confusion also. And no, and they <laughs> want to know how they want to get married. What are yes. the clothes they want to wear? What's the food they want to eat? Sure. What's the guest experience they want to create? All of that takes time. And with the wedding planners, with hotels, with the travel partners, you know, with the entire ecosystem, with the designers, you know, what's my floral palette going to be like? And I think about a decade ago, maybe Vanna would know this better, maybe the brides really ruled the roost. <laughs> now the bridegrooms are also, you know... Uh, but so as long as the parents are paying for the money, it's good news <laughs> for the hotels and the wedding industry, right? Would you agree, Vandana? Yeah, today not only just the parents, but the young couple is also actually uh, paying for their own weddings. And that's become a trend which is very interesting. As far as the hotels go, I think uh, we really need a lead time with them because there are many hotels, but yet they're not enough. Great. Before we move on to Brian, one, one question for Vandana. What is the maximum number of reckeys you've done for a wedding, whether it was India or anywhere else? <laughs> We've done actually 
Number of reckeys for a wedding is minimum seven to eight wow. reckeys. Great. We have done. Because I'll tell you why. Everybody would look at it and say, why do you need seven reckeys? I say that I don't need to come for a recce to Rajasthan because I know Rajasthan inside out. We know Jodhpur, Jaipur, Jaisalmer, all the places because we are here every year, at least twice a year. So I can even tell you which stone is tarnished in, um, you know, in Udaipur. But the reason we do so many reckeys is, and that's why we do what we do, is that we just need to be prepped. Sure. We need to collaborate with them, with them, and to make sure that we're on the same page to give it that absolute amazing experience. You can imagine if there are seven reckeys, the number of food tastings, and one reason why I would like to, a foodie like me would like to be a wedding planner is so that I could be sitting through all the food tastings. <laughs> but that's great. I just want to say one more thing that actually it's not only about the dates, right? That's one sure. part. And of course, the reckeys are another part of it. You're also wanting your loved ones and your family and friends from across the world to come. Sure. And you also have to today be a little bit more mindful of their time than probably we were in the past. Sure. And you know, we are in India, so we attend a lot of weddings. And that's also one season. reason why we're in India because of the time factor. You, yeah. because. The word is mindful of their time, which is yeah. why you want places which you can access and not have your friends to, you know, go on a nine hour flight. And that is one reason why Wed in India is there just at the right time. Brian, you started your career in the event industry. Of course, I know you as, as the gentleman who is to host the morning show, which I would look forward to hearing on FM. But of course, you got into the event industry when there was nothing like wedding planning and you have seen so many venture into weddings some carve a niche successfully and some just so what uh, what what have you really noticed along the way on this industry well it's been a beautiful crazy journey there are some of us in the room who were there on the starting blocks um i, I just want to qualify myself i mean the wedding business was never ever something i felt convinced i could do well right which is why i've only gotten married once about <laughs> hopefully successfully and happily, but on a more serious note, yes, the industry started when, uh, when the corporates really of brands and brand spends were the domineering factor. Sure. And uh, I'm sure there are people in the room who will agree with me when I say, we were looked at, you know, with the proverbial raised eyebrow, you know, I mean, who's this joker? Who's this Jugard, you know, Jugadu who's walked into our office? Uh, and the, the line was not in every case, why do I need an event manager? I have an admin department that does all my stuff for me. Those were the early days. And then, of course, we've progressed. Cut to today when I do believe, and it's out there, the numbers are out there, and we discussed this earlier, where the wedding business or the wedding planning business and the wedding delivery business is probably equal to the other businesses put together. I'm talking of corporate spends, I'm talking about sports spends and government spends and the likes. So we've come a long way. Speaking of weddings, I do believe that there are a few things, you know, that attracted people to get into this to answer your question. Uh, the two different dynamics were if you had to get into the corporate life, you were dealing with brands, you were dealing with strategies around brand marketing, you know, and the likes, brand development. But in the wedding business, it was personalized. You were dealing, as we've discussed all morning, with whether it was the bride or the groom, or the parents of the bride and groom, or the siblings of the bride and groom. And my goodness, I thought one marketing manager was a task to deal with. To deal with five and six decision makers around one single wedding was nothing short of suicide in my mind. Yeah. So I have always doffed my hat uh, to the early people who took the charge and decided to get into the wedding business. Uh, I would quietly call them suckers for punishment. But uh, how wrong have I been proved? How wrong have I been proved? So it has grown to answer your question, Parthib, into, into a flourishing business. Uh, I have a couple of submissions, if I might, uh, like in the rest of the businesses that fuel the experiential economy. I do believe that we need to move on. One of the areas that we spoke about earlier today was in educating ourselves. It's fine for the few of us to sit here and feel, you know, we are blessed. We've been there, done that, you know, we know the stuff and all of that. True, not true, debatable. But I do believe as an industry, 
one of the key things is we need to be prepared for growth. And I say this with courage of conviction. Uh, we're looking at it very strongly in EMA and I'm uh, deep diving into that area. We need to be ready for it. You know, it's one thing sitting there, you know, soaking in the sun. It's growing at, you know, 40% compounded annual growth rate, blah, blah, blah. Are we ready for that growth, exponential growth? I think it's a question that we need to do, to take. Take that long, hard look in the mirror. I talk to agencies today and ask them a basic question. Have you done a SWOT analysis? And they look at me, firstly, to decode what SWOT stands for. Uh, I'm generalizing. No, I do apologize. I don't wish to trivialize agencies and how they think. I'm talking about generally, right? We need to be prepared for this opportunity that keeps coming our way. So education is the one big thing. And the second big thing, again, touched on earlier this morning was, while we tend to focus on the very evident places in this country that, uh, that are beautiful as destinations for weddings, I do firmly believe that it's some of the tier two towns, and I won't get into micro details, that we should be looking at very, very cleverly definitely come to and that, purposefully. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Talking of preparedness, Raj, do you know about this whole, what is it that we really need to be aware about the whole travel ecosystem in India? We know the challenges when it comes to airline travel and domestic. And of course, there are some beautiful destinations. Some of the destinations where the uh, NRIs, which they have seen in the movies, they want to get married. We know that, you know, the, the, the airport connectivity is limited. It's a couple of hours away. What else do we really need to be prepared for? to move into what Brian called, not just for the agencies, but as a country or the travel fraternity, because they also are playing such an important role in influencing their clients when it comes to growth for Wed in India. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, a great welcome to all our overseas visitors who have come all the way to our beautiful country. A big applause. Uh, and uh, to the Ministry of Tourism, Fiki and Rajasthan, that continuity is going on from last 12 years, which is very, very important. And as you said, you know, we have so many beautiful destinations in India where connectivity is not good. Sure. But I think now the Indian Railways is doing a beautiful job. I think job. we should start have a new thing on VED on rails. That is a, on rails. I yeah. hope someone from the Railway Ministry is here to... I just give you a small example. I, I must tell you, all our friends here were actually very excited about the rail journeys, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, you know, I just tell you that when I started my career as a travel agent, but uh, during COVID, one has learned that you have to be a multi-skill. Sure. So we shifted our focus before COVID itself to various uh, segments and wedding is one of that. And in last one and a half year, we did more than 220 weddings, social events and so on. So the connectivity is very good. Uh, we did a uh, one event, not a wedding, but a inaugural of an international golf course in Ludhiana, where there is no airport. Uh, no connectivity. If we take them by road, it takes seven to eight hours. So what we do, we went to the Indian railways, we hired two executive class coaches and we took around 400 people uh, in uh, the two coaches also and in the railway, uh, Volvo coaches also. But the experience they gained in the uh, railway was amazing. So during the wedding also, we are promoting that. And some of the ceremonies even they can do it in the railway coach also. Because in the planes, you know, you can't move, the air hostess will disturb you, you have to fasten your belt. Railways, you have your space. <laughs> yeah, you have to fasten your belt, there is a turbulence also, but in the railway coach, you can move around, you can enjoy, you can dance, whatever you want to do. It's not just weddings, it's also travel with your loved ones, and yeah. which is why we know yeah. travel experts like you also have an edge. Yeah. If the wedding planners have the, have the knowledge and experience with design, it's about the travel way. Yeah, that's great. great. And you know, the, we have not thought that, uh, you know, in, uh, we can have a wedding in a place like Jammu and Kashmir. You know, now we are having so many weddings in Jammu and Kashmir also, which is amazing. You Absolutely. Know, thought of uh, whether that. it's the Lalit Srinagar, Taj yeah, Srinagar, yeah, Taj all of them Srinagar. are hosting. There was a wedding last uh, week there in Lalit and it was a crazy experience. Beautiful and Radisson, uh, with Radisson having just opened, we will see a lot of, because after all, there are very few locations in India where you have good weather in the summer months. Yeah. You know, one of the things which we are always, which I would have loved to focus on is location, location, location. And I'd like to start with Vandana before I move on to Munisha. 
WDC orchestrates big fat weddings and intimate weddings. And I know you did a, if, if previously if you were in Cannes, next you were in Kochi. So which are the, some of the locations in India, particularly in South India, because you've just come back from Kochi, where you look forward to doing, orchestrating a simple or a grand wedding vandana? You know, Parthiv, we're always looking for locations. We're always looking for venues. We're always looking for hotels that can actually house and we were in Kochi uh, at the Grand Hyatt and I must say it's a beautiful property, very well put together and forget it, it has space, it has banquet halls, it has lawns, it has multi-cuisine um, restaurants. So it's a perfect location for any wedding. I want to do weddings anywhere in India, anywhere in Kerala. I want to go to the Northeast. I am dying to do a wedding there but we just don't have enough infrastructure and hotels. So favorite places, Rajasthan is a no It's so nice to see you being so excited about orchestrating those intimate, maybe a 50 packs, yes, 100 packs and a darjeeling yeah, as much saying, as... Uh, yeah, I'm just, just saying that Indian weddings sometimes are 500, 600 people. But today the mindset of the youngster is changing. We are coming to 200, 250 people weddings. To hold those, there are hotels. The Lalit has Khajurao. Guys, has anybody ever been to the Khajurao 90 room wedding? property, I've never no, been there. No, we don't. Okay. Yeah. They have Bekal. There are hotels. Taj is, of course, one of the largest number of hotels across the country. We work tremendously with them. The Marriott hotels, they give us a great um, opportunity in terms of the cities that they are in. There are many hotels that can house us, but yet we are really falling short of the number of rooms that we require in each venue to be able to host a wedding and not just the big fat Indian wedding, just the infrastructure for an Indian wedding. Monisha would love to hear from you about some new properties which are opening. We've seen how Bangalore has done very well in the uh, all year good, thanks to its all year good weather factor besides of course your amazing property. Have you visited Golfshire? Yes, yeah. Oh great, I'm sure. So what about some new properties which are opening in before I move on to Ritika? And Ritika's question will be more about international markets to tap because that's something we've not discussed yet. Please go ahead, Manisha. So, uh, Partha, first, of course, I would like to say that, yeah, we have a gorgeous hotel in Shillong and, you know, weddings are happening there. But I think one of the things that I'd like to touch upon over here right now is, you know, when we're talking about weddings, uh, and this is kind of a very unorganized sector. True. So, we've started really going into it collecting all our data, insights across, of course, our India hotels, which are now 150. Um, and one of the things that we noticed, and you know, coming back to lead times also, is that tier two and tier three cities, and even most of our properties, because you know, like I said, because I guess when you're not planning a wedding in a palace, it's, it even happens very quick. We've seen lead times of two, three months, four months. Six is normal. It is extremely normal. Uh, we've also had hotels suddenly get up and say we have a wedding within two months. Um, tier two cities like a Bilaspur, Raipur, all those cities also we are seeing weddings which, I mean, those hotels are doing amazingly well. So I guess it, this industry is so vast. It depends on no the level. No two weddings, that, even in yeah. one city, one family will be remotely similar. And, right? and also different uh, socioeconomic stratas. So sure. it totally depends that, you know, uh, whether it's a premium hotel, let's say a luxury hotel, or whether it's a select service hotel, you've got different wide range of uh, requirements over there. So I guess, yes, it's a growing industry. We are seeing um, every place. We are also, we already have a lot of interest being shown for our Marriott Hotel in Katra. Nice. Which has just opened. So yeah, spiritual destinations spiritual always work. In fact, also. India, the destination much before destination weddings even came in, uh, places like Tirupati were anyway doing a lot of NRI weddings who would come there to the temple town. Except that back then they would be comfortable with basic accommodation. Today we all know how the bride and the bridesmaids want to pose, and obviously uh, any any dormitory or hotel will not work, yeah. <laughs> right? Rutika, you know. The NRI market, I'm sorry, we just have five minutes left, so I request everyone's attention because I've already got two reminders. Ritika, there's the NRI market, but within the NRI market, I'm sure, what, which are some of the, uh, you know, communities or countries which you're really targeting as Taj Group? I'm really referring to your palace properties uh, or some of your beach locations uh, when it comes to this market. Okay. Um I'll take it in two parts. Sure. The first part, I agree with Monisha that India itself is such a diverse country. You know, we have now more than about 200 hotels across the country. 
we are opening about 25 hotels this year. So when you talk about a Patna, you talk about a Bhopal, you talk about a Jalandhar, you talk about Amritsar. Uh, weddings are important there also. Uh, and of course, a lot of them have families overseas. So not everybody will probably come out to a palace or to maybe a beach resort. Sure. But for sure, they will come to some of these cities. Uh, and the communities that are doing so well, India is doing so well, Indians overseas today, I think are one of the most sought after community of people. To In travel. professional, as professionals of or course. businessmen, both. And also as spenders. So when you take a look at it, uh, you know, the countries that you take a look at, I think uh, the love for India is very, very prominent in every part of the world. So now whether it is South Asia, whether it is America, whether it is Europe, it really doesn't matter. Whether it's even, uh, you know, uh, even in Africa, because there's such a large uh, diaspora of Indians. And I think they all want to come back to their motherland, even if it might be the second generation that has never been to India before. And their friends here, family here, have told them about food at the Taj. So it may not be, they may yes. not, if it is a February 14th wedding, they can forget about getting the Taj, Goa or, you, so know, you know, Med Bhavan. But I think, <laughs> and I think one more thing for sure for us, which is yeah. an unfair advantage, I think, but for sure it is, we are now 120 years old. So what are the weddings that we have done or not done in the last more than a century? So whether it's a beautiful palace, whether it is something that you created on the balmy beaches of Goa or Kerala, in uh, you know, Kurg or Bekal or Munar, or you kind of just come to one of our newest palaces uh, in Gwalior, which is Usha Kiran Palace Gwalior. And if you want to go back to a spiritual uh, wedding, go to Banaras, go to like the Taj Nadesar Palace, which is by the way, a city, Banaras is the most uh, visited city in the country ahead of Goa. And a lot of people go there wow. to Solomon. Wow, Banaras weddings. is the most visited city. So, and of course, I'll, I'll end that on one thing. How can one forget the boy girl meets at the sea lounge? It all ah. starts at the Taj. <laughs> I'll, just two yes. minutes, one question for, uh, for Brian and Rajan. Brian, we all talk about wedding planning as a profession, but beyond that, where else do you see opportunities, niche opportunities for those who want to make a mark in this industry? Well, you know, there are the many factors or factions within the industry that we spoke about and uh, like you said, we're short of time. I'll try and just quickly press, press it down to the north-south axis. You know, there is reach and resonance that we need to work towards. And on the east-west axis, you know, there is the two sides, the buyer and the seller or the consumer and the other stakeholders who populate the room we're talking about. I think we need to, in a focused manner, look at all of these areas. To really be precise, the two areas that resonate deeply with me, I spoke about one a little earlier, we need to be adequately prepared to meet with the rising demand. And I say that extremely happy, uh, happily. The other area that I do believe we need to be cognizant of is the fact that we need to come together more often. Uh, I am extremely excited and grateful for this opportunity, for instance. But to create reach and to marry it to resonance, I do believe we need to be together. And today, we live in an age, I do not like the word fidgetal too much, but one cannot wish away the digital. In fact, I embrace the digital. So just a few thoughts in my head about keeping the community together. It could be this level of stakeholder, it could be the consumer or the user as well. Create something in the digital space that will help us stay together through the year. And these could be moments like these, expos like these, could be the culmination of that at whichever time of year we choose. I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'm on borrowed Thank time, you. so I'll really speak. <laughs> no, I'm done. Yeah, great. I'm Just done. the verticals you were talking yes, about, yes, besides yes. wedding planning, do you, of course, everybody's very aware that a planner is one vertical. Yes. You have stylists, you have bars, you have um, people who do, I'm just getting into semantics. E invitations. So, invitation, show flow. You have people who are FOH in terms of hospitality terminology, if you know, front of house. There is so much that our weddings entail and skill set. The one question when we hire today, I ask somebody, what is your skill set? I just need to understand where you're coming from, what is your skill set, and what value can you add? Because wedding planning is just one large aspect. Under that, there are about 
35, 40 Absolutely. verticals, which everybody can actually be a part of. We could have, we should have actually had a one and a half hour session, but, but final, Sir Rajan, sorry, it's a very, very yeah. vast subject, but tech, just your thoughts, food for thought, literally, on, on tech and weddings. You know, in India, uh, because uh, wedding is a very important, uh, uh, you know, festival, it's like a national festival. So tech comes later, but I agree with Mr. Joseph when you said Har Din Shubh Hai. But in India, I agree with you, Har Din Shubh Hai except the dry day, you know, which is very important for the weddings. Ah, so, I like that. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, you know, I think when the pundits give you date, it's not sure whether the wedding will be uh, successful or not. So one has to do it uh, throughout the year. Uh, except the dry day and uh, the tech is playing a very very important role sure. because uh, you know the bride the uh, both they can have uh, uh, these see the app the destinations sure. uh, through the technology there's a lot of inspiration but we don't know how much decision making uh, yeah, but of course, that's a very that requires a different you know, subject you can say altogether. do it yourself you know so they do lots of planning on their own <laughs> so which is very very Great. important yeah. i think maybe request all panelists to kindly come forward for a photo op thank you very much and sorry to keep it so rushed Thank you very much indeed. And I would also like to invite on stage Mr. R.K. Suman, Deputy Director General and Regional Director North, Ministry of Tourism, Northern Region, to kindly do the honors of presenting a small token of gratitude and appreciation to all our eminent panelists. First, a group photograph. Sir, may I request you to kindly join the panelists for the group photograph? Thank you. Uh, requesting Mr. R.K. Suman to do the honors of presenting the mementos. We begin with presenting to our distinguished moderator, Mr. Parthep Tyagrajan. Thank you very much indeed. We present to Ms. Monisha Devan, Vice President, Sales and Distribution, South Asia Marriott International. Thank you very much indeed, ma'am, for sparing your time. To Ms. Ritika Gupta, Vice President, Corporate Sales, IHCL. Thank you, ma'am, for being here with us. To Mr. Rajan Segal, Co-Founder and Advisor, Premier Lifestyle Events. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for being here with us. To Ms. Vandana Mohan, Founder, The Wedding Design Company. Thank you. 